Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, the 12 o'clock block here on March the 5th. And here we are. I just got back from vacation. I'm feeling good. <laughs> okay, Community Matters with Andrea Flagg, an old friend of mine. We served together on the board of directors of the Hawaii Academy of Sciences. She went on to be the president or the chair, chair. Huh? Mm -hmm. the chair of the Hawaii, uh, the board of Hawaii Academy of Sciences, and she's still on that board. Right. And in fact, if you didn't know it, I want to tell you right now, okay, that runs, the Hawaii Academy of Science runs not only the Science Cafe, I guess it still runs the Science yes. Cafe, but much bigger than that, it runs the Hawaii State Science Fair. Wow. Exactly. Fabulous. And we are affiliated with the International Science and Engineering Fair, where we send our winners from the Hawaii uh, Science and Engineering Fair, uh, and they get to be exposed to all uh, students from all over the world, you know? Yeah. And they realize, oh my goodness, I'm not the only nerd. There's other nerds <laughs> everywhere else. <laughs> nerds are good people. I agree. I'm a nerd. I love myself. <laughs> so um, how'd you get to be a nerd, Andrea? Uh, I think, uh, I actually don't know. I was this little and, and I, I told my mom, I said, Mom, how do I become a professor? And she told me, honey, I don't know. You have to find that out yourself. <laughs> and I always had a knack for the natural sciences, you know, particularly biology. And I was just fascinated how life works. And I guess that well, everything else is history, you know. <laughs> so you are the chief for the, well, the assistant chief of biomedical research at Queen's Look. Queens Medical Center, right? What, what does that involve? So we're Associate Director for Biomedical Research at the Queens Medical Center. And basically, what we have done 20 years ago, the Queens Medical Center and the University of Hawaii really had a very good collaboration. They still collaborate very well. But uh, 20 years ago, they decided, we want more biomedical researchers in Hawaii. And they recruited uh, myself and, and my husband uh, to come to Hawaii. Reinhardt. Reinhold, Reinhold, Reinhold Penner, uh, and said, hey, here, build something. All we want to see from you what we want to see from is papers and grants. And I tell you, those two words are the most powerful world because that's how you make it or break it, you know, Isn't with papers true? and grants. grants. Yeah. Uh, and so that's Publish how- Publish or perish. Yeah. Publish or perish, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, but you, you got, at some point, you got into um, um, uh, immune system research. Yeah. Yes. And that, that's a specialty. That's, 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 that's pretty specialized, isn't it? So our basic premise so from a scientific point of view is that we study cellular communication. You know, cells, how do they communicate with each other and how, how does, which proteins are involved. And basically, all, we all know if communication breaks down, boom, that's it, right? And so in disease, the same thing happens. Cells cannot communicate properly with each other anymore and then disease happens. So have you cancer, autoimmune disease, what, what, whatever it is. And so we are, we, are, we are coming from a basic research background in that we really wanted to understand, okay, uh, which proteins are involved in that process. And so we are studying uh, proteins in the plasma membrane of cells, and they are so-called ion channels. And these, you can imagine, they're little gates. And these gates, they allow to, the flux of, of calcium, magnesium, potassium, chloride, in and out of the cell in a controlled fashion. And so that was our background. Now, we we always wanted to identify which proteins, which ion channels does a cell have. And you know, the past 20 years have seen the genomics and all that. And so we identified maybe five or six proteins, ion channels. And so then we say, okay, once we understand these ion channels, which disease model do they fit? So we don't come from, we study autoimmune disease, we study cancer. We come from the ion channels that the targets, the molecular targets that we work with where do they do their job? And if that job goes wrong, which disease happens? And so that is our approach. Okay, so this now the research you're doing, I want to clarify, is with your company. You and Reinhold have a company called Cybera, is it? Cythera. Cythera. Mm -hmm. And Cythera is doing research on this kind of, call it communication. Um, mm -hmm. Communication of cells, communication of ions and the like. It's not for Queens, not the Queens Medical so, Center, or is it? It is. So what we've done is uh, basically our whole research uh, it, it has been based at the Queens Medical Center. It's our home institution. They've been wonderfully supportive all those years. But we create patents. And these patents, they belong to the Queens Medical Center. And so what we've done, we have, we have founded a company 
uh, to help patients with autoimmune, Z, autoimmune, autoimmune disease based on one of those patents. So we have, as a company, have licensed the patent from Queens. So it's basically, uh, we don't, we are not in the business, we're scientists, we're not in the business of building an empire or the next Amgen or so. We are really very focused on how can we apply our, our research, and that is through the licensing and patent, patenting uh, um, process. So you're taking work that has already been patented mm -hmm. and you're taking it further. You're exactly. refining the art, so to speak. Exactly. Because what we do is we work at a, at a clinic, at a medical center. So every day we see patients. I mean, we don't treat patients. We are not physicians. Uh, but we you're a PhD. I'm a PhD. In but in bio, biochemistry. In biomedical sciences, biomedical. specialty neurosciences. Okay, I want to get that straight. Yes, okay. exactly. That's really something. <laughs> yeah. And you took that a long time ago. Where? Oh, at the University of Hawaii. Uh, I okay, did my okay. PhD at JAPS so in John and A. Burns School of Medicine. And Reinhold, how about him? What does he, he got? He's got a PhD in pharmacology from Germany, University of Gießen. Perfect match. Because one goes hand in glove with the other, doesn't Exactly, it? it does, yeah. And you still get along in this company together? We do. We are a 24-7 team. Don't ask me how that works. <laughs> oh, you can. I have a few answers today. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, we, 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 I, we're, we're okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you have to have a laboratory. Do you have a laboratory in Queens or outside of Queens? So basically, the, the, the company that we founded is, is, if you wish, a virtual company in, in the sense that things that we don't know about, we outsource. So we basically, we know we have built the business plan. We know how, exactly how to develop. Uh, I, it's a, it's a, so what we did is we, we focused on FDA approved drugs. We said, okay, we want to go fast to the market, right? And the idea was always, okay, uh, we find a target that is in our research, uh, then find a drug. We did drug screening. We started that 10 years ago uh, at the Queens Medical Center, nonprofit research uh, 10 years ago to uh, help patients with autoimmune disease because we knew uh, how that works on a cellular level, on a cellular level. We were lucky. We, together with John Liu from Johns Hopkins, we identified an uh, clofazimine, which is actually a, uh, an anti-leprosy drug. Uh, uh. So it, it's an antibacterium, if you wish. Uh -huh. And we found a human target. And that human target is specific for a certain type of immune cell. Now, you have to understand, there's two types of immune system. There's the primary, which is responsible for invasions, you know, of all sorts of uh, fighting off uh, yeast and, and bacteria and viruses and cancer cells and, all, mm, and so okay. on. And once that has been done, some cells survive and they remember. They're called memory T cells. They remember, oh, I've seen this bacteria before. Boom, attacks it. Invasion is over much faster. Now... Autoimmune disease, what happens is the immune system is overactive, okay? And what's overactive is the secondary immune part, those memory T cells, and they underlie most of the autoimmune diseases. There's about 80 of them. And, and they attack different organs. They attack the whole system. For some reason, we don't understand. So the current, there's no cure for this. What happens is there's, a, there's an increase in, 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 in the disease, then there goes dormant, then there's an increase, then it goes dormant, and so on. So the, when there's a spike, patients are treated. And then the, treat, the current treatment suppresses the whole immune system. It suppresses the primary immune system and the secondary immune system. And that causes all sorts of long-term problems. Cancer, infections, you name you it. need to have your immune system working properly. Exactly. So with clofazamine, the drug, so what clofazamine does, it suppresses the secondary immune system, part of it, the memory T cells. It suppresses the ones that are actually causing the autoimmune disease. We don't know why the memory T cells do that, but we do know if we suppress those, we can help patients with this. Mm. So, the, uh, trapezamine, can you spell it? Clofazamine, C L O F I. No, I, I'm, I'm a very bad spelling bee person. Tro, tro. Clo, C L O. Oh, Clofaz. it's on the screen. Here we go. There we go. Oh, yeah, thank you. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right, so this, <clears throat> this will moderate the 
autoimmune system from going out of control. Mm -hmm. And that's a surprise, because that's not what it was originally developed exactly. before. Exactly. And that's, that's the magic of what you're doing with Reinhold, that you're finding drugs that were directed at one thing, mm -hmm. and you're finding that they're useful in another capacity. Exactly. And tropaz tropa I, I tropazamine. I tropazamine yeah. is, is one of those drugs. Exactly. And so uh, and it's, it has a way of, uh, what, um, moderating the um, autoimmune system so that the memory, the T cell memory exactly. cells, exactly. that might go out of control. Exactly. Does it make them lose their memory? Does it make them inert in some way? No, no, they don't. It's so. So, for example, so we're tackling psoriasis first, which is an autoimmune disease of the skin. The skin is one of our largest organs that we have, and so you, it's the, it's only the cells that are under under the patch. Psoriasis. Under the psoriasis patch under the so-called plaque, those cells under there, they are overactive and that causes the growth of skin cells and they build up and then you, they scale and then you have these open wounds, if you wish. Which can lead to other things. Exactly, you know, infections and all that. So that's why we're developing a topical cream so that as soon as it starts up, you apply the cream containing clofazimine and the prediction is, based on our, our research, our nonprofit research and our patent and, and the publications that we mm. have, that it should calm down that area, yeah. So, okay, so you've identified one uh, target, mm -hmm. target illness, target yes. disease, mm -hmm. namely psoriasis. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're working on these days, the psoriasis, or do you have other uh, autoimmune problems you're working on also? So the, the idea for the company now is that psoriasis will be used as proof of concept. Mm -hmm. Because once you have proof of concept, then because other autoimmune diseases are caused by the same mechanism, you can then eat clofazamine as a pill, for example. You can develop that. It probably won't be us, but the idea is that you then spread out. Um, so you look for other targets. We look for other targets. Once you yeah. find the, the, the mechanism mm -hmm. by which it works. Yes. Have you found the mechanism by which it works? Yes, we have identified. What is the mechanism? It's a, a potassium ion channel called KV1.3. Oh, of course, at home, my wife and I speak of little else right. at dinner, yeah. Exactly. 1.3 I mean, it was, yeah. Give me a Chinese word, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's a potassium. Now, the trick with potassium channels is we have a lot of different kinds of potassium channels. And the heart needs potassium channels, right? So if you suppress potassium channels in your heart, you basically die. So the FDA has said every single new compound that comes out to the market has to be tested for it it's acts on potassium channels mm -hmm. in the heart. Now, this particular potassium channel, the KV1.3, Hachi, thank you very much, right? <laughs> that one um, is, is particularly overexpressed, so it come, it's massively upregulated in memory T cells. It's massively over, it, it expressed elsewhere also, but it's at so low, low levels uh, that other potassium channels can do the job and it uh -huh. doesn't really matter. Uh -huh. So that's why, because these T's, the memory T's, they rely on this particular potassium channel that they're very sensitive to inhibition by any compound that is selective. Is my right to think, and I, I could be way off on this, but my right to think, a potassium channel, it's a communicator. Yes. It's, it's, that's why in the heart it's important. That's why it's, it, the, the FDA wants to know about it. Yes. Because it communicates to other cells. Exactly. So that's a profound discovery. That, that, this, that if you change the way the potassium works, you're changing the way the messaging works to the autoimmune cells. Yeah. yeah, and that is based on hundreds of scientists' work, so that's not our work. We just, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, we just thought, okay, it, it was serpentivitous, you know, because there's other mechanisms that, that regulate what, what this particular potassium ion channel regulate, but uh, those, the, and that is the beauty of clofazamine. It's very specific. Many drugs are non-specific. They they are very good for one target, but then they also affect this one and that one and this one. And that's why this particular target and drug is a beautiful, beautiful dance, if you wish. Yeah, beautiful. It is. So. Science is beautiful. It's, and research you, is beautiful. You can tell I'm getting all excited. You yeah, know, that's okay. <laughs> I am too. So much so that we're going to have to take a break. <laughs> <laughs> That's Andrea Flagg, and uh, she's the Associate um, Director of um, Biomedical Research 
uh, in uh, the Queen's Medical Center. And she's also a principal with her husband, Reinhold, in Cythera, which is a, a virtual research company that's working on autoimmune diseases. And we're going to find out more. In fact, we're going to go back and look at that slide, and you can explain it to us right after this very short break. This guy looked familiar. He calls himself the Ultra Fan, but that doesn't explain all this. Why? Why? He planned this party, planned the snacks, he even planned to coordinate colored shirts, but he didn't plan to have a good time. Go, go. Now you wouldn't do this in your own house, so don't do it in your team's house. Know your limits and plan ahead so that everyone can have a good time. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense. We're back, and we're, we're getting deeply into this subject with Andrea Flagg. Uh, she's a principal of Cythera, um, which deals with um, research on autoimmune systems. And they stand on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. That is, they, they find drugs that have already been approved and patented and all that, and they take them another step, see if they can find another use for them. And in this case, uh, she's working on something which uh, involves um, uh, psoriasis. And what's the chemical again? Clofazamine. <coughs> no, um, cl clofazamine, mm -hmm. but... Uh, oh, the channel? The, the channel. KV1.3. Which is? A, a potassium ion channel. Potassium. Yeah, potassium. Okay, so about yeah. potassium, yeah. you know, it's good for you. Sometimes. <laughs> it is. But too much is not good for you. Uh, it's more sodium that's not good for you. Okay, then. all right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's it. the balance, you know. <laughs> <coughs> so let's look at that slide now for a minute and see if we can get a, a full explanation of clofazamine, and this is the mechanism that uh, Andrea was talking about before. What does this slide tell us? So we have uh, four different panels here, and you want to look at the left upper panel, where what you see is what's called a current-time relationship. Currents, basically what these currents are, tiny, tiny currents that we measure in a single cell. In this case, a single T lymphocyte. That is, it's a cell line, so it's not, uh, you know, we, we perpetuate it. It's, it's coming out of a cancer, um, human cancer of lymphoma. Um, and what we do is we, we use biophysical methods to measure currents in these cells. And what you see, uh, the, the blue line basically uh, is the control. So we have 100% current over 200 seconds, nothing happens. Now, if you apply increasing concentrations, of clofazamine, um, you have the orange one, I believe, is 100 nanomolar. You see a little bit reduction in the current, uh, this tiny current measured in one cell. And then when you add, uh, when you uh, apply from the outside of the cell 10 micromolar clofazamine, you basically get 75% uh, suppression of the current. Now, how does that correlate to what the cell does? And that is shown on the uh, right upper panel where you have what's called a dose-response curve. So uh, what we looked at is the release uh, of T lymphocytes of a certain um, protein that's called uh, IL-2. IL-2 is, is an important cytokine in, in the immune disease, uh, in, in the immune process. And if you, on the, on the uh, x-axis, you see the increase in concentration of clofazamine. And what you can t see is that if you increase the concentration of clofazamine, the less IL-2 will be secreted from the T cells. And the inhibitory half uh, concentration, in this case, is 630 nanomolar. So you only have to have 630 hundred nanomolar in your system to reduce the IL-2 production by 50%. Okay, now we know on the cellular level. Now let's go into the animal level. The animal level is shown on the left lower panel. You see this? Uh, Cute mouse, mice are cute animals, I tell you, so we'll be very careful with them. Um, we're very conservative, very aware of that we are working with mice and with animals. So what we did in this case, um, what you have to understand is that mice do ha have a different immune system than humans, 
and they don't use this potassium ion channel KV1.3. They don't need this ion channel to uh, cause an immune response, and therefore we could not use, we could not test clofazamine on a normal mouse. So we had to use what's called a humanized mouse. And a humanized mouse is a mouse that has no uh, T cells in this case, and, for, and they have to be kept in very sterile conditions because they cannot mount an immune response. So um, what we did is we injected human T cells into these mice, <coughs> supplemented them with T cells, and then what we did is we, we uh, did an organ transplant. We took human skin and we transplanted that on the, those mice. And the control mice in the upper uh, day 0, 8, and 19, you can see that that, that, that kind of shrivels up the this, this skin, right? It becomes crown and flaky, like when you heal, you get like a, a crust. That means that the organ, the skin was rejected. Why? Uh, because uh, clofazamine did not work. Um, but if, you, if the mice who have the clofazamine given, the T cell activity is suppressed and the organ is not uh, rejected, as you can see with this little nine, nice brown patch uh, at day 19 on the lower panel. Uh, so it works. It works. <clears throat> How, has it gotten further? It hasn't gotten to humans yet, though, huh? No, that's what we're currently fundraising for. So we are in the seed round fundraising. I cannot go into details, uh, but um, for many reasons. <laughs> but th that is the next step. So create uh, a topical cream and then do what's called uh, uh, animal toxicology to make sure that the cream itself doesn't cause like the skin to fall off, you know? Right, right, right. right. And then once then with those data, we can file an uh, IND in investigation new drug with the FDA. And after that, with this IND, we are allowed to go into clini human clinical trials. Okay, have you published anything about this? Yeah, so what the slide that you've seen has been published. Th uh, that slide, it was an article actually. It, there's an article from 2008. Um, Where was it published? It was published in PLOS One, mm -hmm. which is quite a good journal actually. Mm -hmm. um, and together with Jun Lu from Johns Hopkins, his oh. group and our group. Okay, so now you raise money mm -hmm. to do clinical trials. My recollection is that usually clinical trials cost a fortune. Yes. So you have to raise a lot of money for this. We have to raise a lot of money. However, uh, so, so the, um, the beauty of psoriasis is that um, it is a relatively... If there is a beauty in psoriasis, if there is a you're going to hear about it now. <laughs> The beauty. Maybe we should have named the show The Beauty of Psoriasis. The Beauty of Psoriasis. <laughs> oh my goodness. Thank you. Yes. How, <laughs> so so the, the advantage of when you look at a, a disease, you want to have something that is not lethal, right? You don't, you don't want to have the, the patients who suffer the most. Um, you, you want to have something where you see relatively quick results. Multiple sclerosis, devastating disease also, takes years to study, which is hard. But if you have proof of concept in something that you can study faster, then you can go into multiple sclerosis with the same concept. So it's, it's relatively inexpensive to do a so, psoriasis so clinical trial. You need fewer patients and you need, um, and it's, it's a faster process. So refresh me on the patent law. If mm -hmm. company A <clears throat> has designed this for, I forget the original use, of, what was it again? Uh, leprosy. Leprosy, mm -hmm. which is you know not pandemic or anything, right, right. Um, and now you're using it for psoriasis, mm -hmm. same same drug, same mm -hmm. methodology. I guess. Mm -hmm. um, you get a you get your own patent, correct? Don't you? Correct. Based on that patent, so it's sort of a a, a finer art, so to speak. So yeah. we don't have a, a, a novel compound. What's our what our patent call is called is a use patent. So we have a use patent where we basically uh, use a known drug that, ha that is FDA approved for, but for a different indication and we repurpose it for a new indication and a new formulation. Uh, so that, that is the patent law. And it's also 20 years. You have it uh, yet? Yes, it's patented. It's, it's, so it's, now it's just a matter of showing that it works exactly. to the satisfaction of the regulators. Exactly. Once the, it works then Sounds to me like you're going to have a solution to psoriasis, yes. which will be amazing because psoriasis, what do they say? The heartbreak, yes. not the beauty, but the heartbreak. The heartbreak, of psoriasis. yes. And, uh, yes. and, and there, isn't, there isn't really a, uh, a specific cure for it until now. It's not a cure. So it's a treatment. It would yeah. be a treatment. You know, we're 90% we're sure it'll work. Uh, and then it will be a treatment, but it will be a treatment where you don't have to swallow anything. 
you know, you don't have to inject anything. You don't have to pay forty thousand dollars a year. Uh, to, Is that what it costs for some yeah, of this? Cer certain treatments are very. The biologics are, are very expensive. Yes. Uh, but they, they work with the side with the side effects of possibly cancer and possibly infections, but. So yeah. the clofazamine is going to be cheaper, yes. cheaper than forty thousand dollars a yes. year. Yes. So there are so there are four different treatments uh, out there right, right now. You have topical creams that many times don't work. They are they run around a thousand dollars a year. Then you have uh, UV light that's about four thousand dollars a year. Uh, then you have corticosteroids, uh, eight thousand dollars a year. And then you have the biologics around forty thousand, thirty, forty thousand dollars a year. So if you look at that picture, if a cre creams, if a cream really works, we probably can price it, or whoever has the company or markets, probably two to three thousand dollars a year, and it will be very likely. It's highly likely that it's going to be reimbursed by by payers. Oh, this would be great. Mm -hmm. you, when you say pay, you mean insurance? Yes, insurance. Uh, oh, that'll be just yeah. terrific. That'll be a real. Yeah, that, that It'll be a game changer. Game changer, and you game can changer. feel really good about that. You've advanced science in that case. And the nice thing is, you know, it doesn't exclude to use biologics, but if, if you start out, it's not like, boom, and I have a huge plaque, you know, but if you, it starts to build up, and if you start with the cream, every single patient is put on creams first before they go to the biologics when they have a, when patients have a flare. Yeah. So if you have a cream that works, well, you don't have to go to the biologics, have you? Yeah, no, just... Go right to the best treatment available. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So where where does this all take us? I mean, I mean, you're talking about some very sophisticated communication, potassium communication channels, and all yeah. this. <clears throat> talking about biochemistry, really at, at, mm -hmm. at the root of it, somehow cellular communication. Ooh, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it reminds me of some of the research at the, at the medical school here at Japsum mm -hmm. um, over cancer. Yes. Um, and I wonder, what's the parallel? What's the connection? What is, what, is there some resonance between what you're doing and, and cancer research? Absolutely. There is the, the, uh, out there in the world, uh, the link between the immune system and cancer is getting the big hype. Um, I'm not particularly, I, don't, I haven't made the connection yet myself, uh, but I know that it's, it's the big buzzword right now. So we are originally immune um, biologists and we are we have moved into cancer from a different angle of research um, about six to seven years ago and so we are also affiliated with the University of Hawaii Cancer Center and so we're hoping that there's a synergy of course yes ah, okay so what's your next project I know you got plenty to work to do on this <laughs> but just leapfrogging over that for Leapfrog. a moment uh, we're currently developing pet imaging tracer tracers for positron emission tomography, um, where we want to see, okay, where do the drugs that we have developed, where do they go in the body, and can we use them to, to diagnose? So we're going into diagnostics with our basic, with our translational research now. Is there enough medical research going on in Hawaii? No. How do we achieve a greater amount of medical research here? Uh, we have wonderful researchers here at JAPSM, at the Cancer Center, at HPU, uh, and there's good collaborations going at, between chemists and biochemistry and, and cancer, uh, cancer researchers. And, uh, but we, we're too small. It would be nice to have more. Um, with the woes, or woes of the NIH, uh, I don't know how we can change that. Luckily, Hawaii is one of the idea stage, which is where traditionally underfund, uh, states that are underfunded by the NIH there's a federal requirement uh, that they pay special attention to these states, and Hawaii is one of them. So we have the Inbre 3, for example, which is a large research network encouraging. So you basically have to start with young people, right? You have to uh, bring up uh, graduate students and postdocs and, and, and give them actually a career perspective. Yeah. Uh, which is uh, hard. And you have to give them jobs, too, I think. Exactly. That's the career's perspective. It's not like, okay, we give you money for the first five years of your career as a system professor, and then, hello, NIH runs out of money. Yeah. Um, but we have the possibility of doing Absolutely. It. We, we have the, mm -hmm. the, the talent. Mm -hmm. We have the interest. We, we have certain institutions that will yes. support it. Absolutely. Um, gee whiz. So it's important that people watch this video and try to understand <laughs> exactly <laughs> the methodology you were describing.
And, and I, I'm a great advocate. That's why I came to Hawaii in the first place. I thought, you know, I did my PhD here at the University of Hawaii in, the, in a job in biomedical, specializing in, in neuroscience. And I just felt that it's so important to come back and, and, and do my best, yeah. you know. And the other thing they can do is come around to the science fair in yes. March and take a look at some of those posters. That's right. Who knows, there might be a poster uh, about Clofazimi. Cl cl that's you know. right. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be interested in seeing that, wouldn't I you? I would go there in first, first come first, you know. Yeah, that's right, yes. Thank you, Andrea. It's been great to talk with Same you. Same here. Thank you so much, Jay. Next time soon. Next time soon. Aloha. In this. Uh